الحمد لله الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على نبي الذي صفى سيدنا رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن اهتدى بهذا أما بعد الحمد لله we are at the last uh, couple of days if not already depleted the month of ربيع الأول and as you very well know in the month of Rabi'u al-Awwal, the focus is on the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So while we discussed a couple of uh, weeks ago from a respected new imam as well and myself previously, that we were focusing on the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, inspirations that we can find in the hayat and the life of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his household and his companions and his history and his Sirah in his life, how he spent his life, what examples he set forth for us and humanity, and what kind of a role model he was for anybody who's a Muslim or non-Muslim. But one question that never ex escapes the psyche of people, right, is the question that even one of our respected Musallin brought to me after I did my last khutbah here, is <clears throat> that Shaykh, why don't you just speak, right, about the innovations regarding the Mawlid of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? So, inshallah, today's topic is there are two positions on this, everybody knows. Everybody knows that there are two positions on this subject. But what is the reality and the fair position in the middle? What is the fair position in the middle? Correct? Now what happens is, unfortunately, because people are not educated and people do not read. I don't know what it is in this day and age. People have gone away from reading their traditions and their history. You look on the internet everywhere for legitimate sources. When I say legitimate sources, meaning websites that are by authentic scholars, mm -hmm. websites by official government or non-government fatwa, recommended places, for instance, Darul Ifta from Egypt, Darul Ifta in Qatar, Darul Ifta in Pakistan. I mean, it doesn't matter if we agree or we do not agree with these websites, the bottom line is Allah has given them some official capacity. I mean, it, you may not respect me or somebody might not respect some other imam from any masjid, but the bottom line is when it's Friday time today, unfortunately, the way Allah has set it up is that I'm going to be leading and you have to be praying behind me. You just have to come to terms with it. The best fatwa that we found on this subject, right, is from Darul Ifta, Darul Ifta al Masriya, the Egyptian fatwa house, the official government fatwa house, or organization that basically people send their questions for and so forth. Let's discuss this first of all. One time a man asked me a question. He said, Shaykh, every time you say the second khutbah, you say, Inna Allaha qala qadeeman wa ma zala qailan alima Inna Allahu malaikatuhu yusalluna ala nabi Ya ayu ladhina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima Some people who are Arabic native speakers, they don't understand. They say, you say, Inna Allaha qala qadeeman. Allah said in the past, Wa ma zala qailan alima He is continuously saying this as he pleases. What do you mean by that? So to make the long story short, Fatwa number 7864, a man asked the same question. He says, we hear some of the khutaba saying, Qala Allah Azza wa Jal, wa la yala yazalu qailan. Some khutaba or the people who give khutba, they say, Allah said, and he's still saying, continuous tense, is this okay? So after making the long story short, I'm not going to go into the details. He says, وَمِنْ هَذَا يَتَّضِحْ أَنَّ الْمُرَادِ لِسَائِلْ هُوَ قَوْلُ الْخُطَبَاءِ وَلَا يَزَالُ قَائِلًا وَإِنَّ هَذَا إِثْبَاتُ دَوَامِ صِفَةَ كَلَامِ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى When we use this kind of morphology in the Arabic language, it means that we are 
establishing for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? The sifa and the attribute of what? Kalam. This was the whole fitna of Imam Ahmad. When Imam Ahmad was taken to jail, right, was for this reason. So one of the things that the four schools of thought and all of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah agree on is that speech, which is the Quran, is one of the sifatu dhatiyya. It's the actual personal attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when I say, إِنَّ اللَّهَ قَالَ قَدِيمًا وَمَا زَالَ قَائِلًا عَلِيمًا الْمَوْضُعْ مَدْرُوسٍ you will learn from our teachers what to say. They taught us what it meant. And we basically are following what our teachers taught. Or Alhamdulillah, our teachers taught us good. You see? Therefore, this is one thing. This gives you the dynamic nature of the Arabic language. The question is, that was asked to the organization that provides official fatwas for the government of Egypt. Is there anything such as bid'a hasana. Is there anything that's called good innovation in Islam? Because automatically, when you hear these words, people automatically take sides. The people who are very strict on sunnah and their interpretation of sunnah, they will say, right? People who tend to go on the Salafi side of things, they will say, there's no such thing as good innovation. All innovations are evil. The Prophet ﷺ says, in a hadith narrated by Jabir in Sahih Muslim, kullu bid'atin dalala. All bid'as are misguidance. وَكُلُّ ضَلَالَةٍ فِي النَّارِ All guidance or misguidance leads you eventually to hellfire. So, why is it then that this is even a question? Because it's not as it sounds. It's not as it sounds. To give you perspective, and we're, talk, we're going to talk about the mawlid of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam later. Let me give you a course in history. Who can tell me the first person who put dots, dots, in the Quran as we read it today? Hajjah. Hajjah. No. Who's oh yes. He's right. Abu al Aswad Ad Duwali and some people call him Ad Duwali. Imam Al Dhahabi wrote his biography and I have it on my phone right now, I'm referring to it. Why did he do that? Ask any scholar, ask any scholar. Ask any scholar, can you graduate from an Islamic seminary without reading the science of Nahu? Give me Mulana Sahib. Can you, they even allow you to read hadith without going Nahu? You're reading Nahu too, right? Dr. Sahib? Right? Okay. Everybody's reading Nahu. Anybody who wants to learn Islamic sciences, he has to read Nahu. Now, the people who are reading the Nahu, if you ask them with all due respect, what is the definition of Nahu? What is the history of Nahu? Do you know this is the most profound bid'ah that nobody likes to talk about and it's ignored? Did you know that? This is the most profound bid'ah that everybody kisses every day and reads every day. People hold halaqas on it every day. Nobody discusses it. So what happened is, this is what Imam al-Dhahabi narrates. He says, أخذ أبو الأسود عن علي رضي الله عن علي رضي الله عنه العربية. So Abu al-Aswad al-Duali or al-Duali, you know what his name was by the way? His name was Zalim bin Amr, oppressor, the son of Amr. Well, it tells you that he was born before Islam, and he never saw that Nabi صلى الله عليه وسلم. And that's why some of the ulama, they call him Mukhadram. Mukhadram means somebody who was born in the time of the Nabi Sallallahu never met the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, hence never became a Sahabi. Because for you to qualify as a Sahabi, you have to be someone who has met the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and died in the state of Islam. You could live a Muslim and then you become Murtad and die as Kafir, not Sahabi, right? But you have. His teacher was Ali radiallahu anhu. 
So he learned Arabic from the household of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So he was listening to a man later in the time of Ali radiallahu anh, reading the Quran. So he twisted the verse of the Quran so bad, he said, oh my God, have things become so worse now? Have things become so worse now? Right? So he went to Ali radiallahu anh. So Ali radiallahu anh who instituted the bid'ah. He said, why don't you come up with a system? Why don't you come up with a system in which we can train people not to deviate from the Arabic, Quraishite Arabic, which I have learned from the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So then he called a student and a writer. Who? Abu Aswad Adu Ali. When? In the time of Ali radiallahu anhu. Are you following me? Some people only like to quote the, the second adhan of Uthman as the example of bid'ah. This is like... This is like fat-free yogurt. That's the easiest thing you can deal with. It tastes sweet. It's not very heavy. It doesn't give you to go to the bathroom. It's fat-free. This is the stuff that you should be talking about. So he says to him, فَلَمَّا جَاءَ الْكَاتِبْ قَالَ وَإِذَا رَأَيْتَنِي قَدْ ظَمَمْتُ فَمِّي فَجْعَلْ نُقْطَةً He says, when I read the Quran and I say, ضَمَّ Like say, Alhamdu, Put a dot there. وَإِذَا فَتَحْتُ فَمِّي فَجْعَلْ عَلَامَةً فَوْقَ الْحَرْفِ when I open my mouth, I say, Qa, put a dot on top of the word. So he was capturing the phonetics of the Quran as the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam transferred it down, right, to the Sahaba. So people would learn that art. When he finished that book and he showed it to Ali radiallahu anhu, Ali radiallahu anhu gave the name, the science. He says, Ma ahsan al nahu nahawtahu. This was the origin of the science of Nahu. He says, مَا أَحْسَنَ النَّحُوْ الَّذِي نَحَوْتَهُ What a beautiful direction you've taken this to. And actually, the word Nahu means direction. So if you ask anybody who's an Arab, يَا شَيْخْ وَانِ الْمَسْجِدِ هَذِهِ النَّاحِيَةِ right? أَوْ نَحُوْ وَهُنَاكِ صح? You ask any Arab, where's the masjid? He'll say, this direction. Nahu. So the science of Nahu is the direction in which the Arab language was taken after the death of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, after the death of Abu Bakr radiallahu an, after the death of Umar radiallahu an, after the death of Uthman radiallahu an, on the authority of Ali radiallahu an, who was the Khalifa of the Muslimin, right? Is there any Sahabi who disagreed with this action? No. Is there any Sahabi who said, no, this is bid'ah? No. Now here's the problem. If you believe in certain interpretations of the sifat of Allah and the aqidah, one of the postulates and the principles is نؤمن بصفات الله بلا تحريف that we believe in all the attributes of Allah without additions or deletions. Now, this act of adding dots and adding fatha and kasra is actually, literally, tahrif of how the Quran was revealed to the Nabi Sallallahu in the Arabic language, صح? Now this is a paradox nobody will be able to solve. فاهمين النقطة فين؟ يعني الصفاء الذاتية حرفتوها يا شباب وجعلتوها الآن مدونة في الكتب. See, that's why when people start to open their mouth, they should be careful. And they should not take on to things which they do not have backgrounds on. And that's when people become crazy. So now we have morphed or demorphed or improved what Allah selected the Nabi to write the Quran as. You go look at the Quran that the Nabi wrote, there are no dots, there are no fatha kasra, there is no dhamma, there is no ghunna, there is no tanween, there is no harf jar, there is no. Follow me? And this is what the ulama call, or the ulama say, is bid'a wajiba. Amongst them is Imam al-Shafi'i. Amongst them is Al-Izzu Abdul Salam, who is a great Shafi'i scholar. Amongst them is Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, who say their bid'a are linguistically defined as any new thing. Any new thing is an innovation. A car is an innovation. iPhone is an innovation. These things are innovation. This microphone is an innovation. But when does an innovation become dangerous in religion? That's a separate discussion. The ulama have taken two positions. One position is the Hanbali position. The Hanbali position, which is what? 
which is Ibn Rajab al-Hanbali. He says, there's no such thing as bad innovation or good innovation. Any innovation in the deen of Allah is bad. Makes sense. It makes sense. But this kind of definition cannot accommodate these actions of the Sahaba. Right? Therefore, the ulama say, al-bid'atu darban. There are two ways of understanding this idea of bid'ah. One is that there is no such thing as bad or good bid'ah. Everything in religion is bid'ah, is evil, right? That is the humbly position. The other position of Imam Shafi'i is basically that bid'ah will be taken as, like this is what Imam Shafi'i says. So Imam Shafi'i says, Al-Muhdathatu an al-Umuri Darban. The innovations in the religion are two types. Ihdahuma ma uhditha aw ma uhditha mimma yukhalifu kitaban aw sunnatan aw atharan aw ijma'an fahadihi bid'adu dalala. Any innovation in the religion that is against Quran and Sunnah and some of the sayings of the Sahaba and the consensus of the ulama. This is an evil innovation that will be misguided. وَالثَّانِي مَا أُحْدِثَ مِنَّ الْخَيْرِ لَا خِلَافَ فِيهِ لِوَاحِدٍ مِنْ هَذَا فَهَذِهِ مُحْدَثَةٌ غَيْرُ مَذْمُومًا If any innovation is brought into the religion, right? Which the Quran, the Sunnah, the Sahaba, and the consensus do not disagree with, do not disagree with, right? Then this is a good thing. For instance, burning of the Qur'ans. All the Qur'ans that Uthman were burned to standardize the Qur'ans is a bid'ah, which is ghair madhmuma. Because at that time, 4,500 sahaba were present. None of them raised their concern that what you're doing is evil, right? The adhan in the Jum'ah, the, the second adhan, is the real adhan. The first adhan was instituted by Uthman and None of the sahaba made an issue with that. It's okay. The Qur'an, the dots on the Qur'an, right? is actually instituted and Nahu is instituted by Ali radiallahu anhu. That is not a bid'ah, that is madhmuma. Now what do you do about issues that came way after the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, like the Mawlid? Fair question. So the answer should be fair. The answer should be fair. Some people say, amongst them, recent ulama and previous ulama, they say, well, this was instituted by the Fatimids. Yeah, this is like the fluff stuff. You don't want to go into too much detail. This is like, you know, the candy version of it. You know, the Egyptians, when they were ruled by the Fatimids, a certain ruling class that came in history, they instituted a lot of innovations. Amongst them was cursing the Sahaba after every Friday prayer. That was one of the innovations. And because of that, some ulama say they were destroyed or wiped from the history, that's fine. But one of them was that, you know, one of the men went to Europe. He saw that in Christmas, the Christians celebrate the Prophet's birthday. He came back. He said, we should have something like this. Let's celebrate the birthday. And then the ulama went and took positions. Some of them took very harsh positions. This is not right. This is, and this is a fight that's still going on today. Right? So then the ulama who celebrate... Right? Some of them took positions in the middle. They say, well, as long as you gather in a place, you talk about the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you make dua, which is a salawat ala rasul, a salat ala rasul dua. Every time you send salutations on the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it's a dua. The format is of a dua because you say, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad, right? You start with Allah. You say, oh Allah, send salutations on the Nabi Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So they said, as long as the guidance is okay and there are no disagreements from the spirit of Sharia, like there is no mixing, there is no drinking, there is no dancing, and things of that nature that are against Islamic principles, then all you're doing is you're reminding people about the times of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and so forth. And the other ulama said, no, this is all wrong. This is all bid'ah. Why? Because the Sahaba who loved the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they were the people who gave 
all of their lives and dedicated them to the Nabi Sallallahu obedience, they never performed such an act. How can you justify to perform such an act? Well, this kind of example, a little bit weak though, because here's the question. If somebody is truly in love with somebody and he remi remembers him every day and weeps in secret, I mean, he doesn't feel the need to just, you know, take it one day and tell the people that he loves somebody. He can die and burn in that love in secret and enjoy the taste of that sweetness without telling the people, you know, by the way, next year come to my home on Tuesdays this, this month. That's... يعني موضوع مخلوص عنه. Now both of the scholars from both teams on this issue, they agree on one principle, that the Sharia should not be compromised. That the adab of the Sharia, right? The principles of the Sharia should not be compromised. This is a, un a united thing in this. And even if you are to interpret that I side with the Hanbali position versus the Shafi'i position, right, on the definition of bid'ah and what type of bid'ah you have, right, then even then they all agree on one thing, that anything in the religion of Muhammad وسلم, that is introduced without a dalil, without a proof from the Quran and the Sunnah and the Ijma' consensus is evil. So there is no problem, essentially. The problem is in how people perceive and misconstrue and put what they call project their disagreements on each other. <coughs> Projecting disagreements is one thing and understanding the real disagreement is totally a separate thing. <coughs> Projecting disagreement. You know what that is? Like for instance, if you meet somebody, you went in and had a fight with them in school, in seventh grade, and all of a sudden that kid is with you all the way to high school. All of a sudden one day you'll realize and you'll have that memory that you know, this kid did me this way when I was in seventh grade. All of a sudden you'll find an opening, you go punch that kid and say, that's for the seventh grade. You're projecting your hatred that way. And unfortunately in Islam, without due justification, the religion and the knowledge of Islam has become a fair open season for anybody who likes to project their anger on each other because they don't understand the Sharia, they haven't done their study yet. Now, what is the recommendation? The recommendation is, these actions are dependent on the niyyah. By the way, there are people in the masjid who asked me four or five years ago about the mawlid that told them it's not right, by the way. Sahih Abu Islam? <laughs> Abu Islam asked me one time, is it okay? I said, no, it's not okay. So I realize what I'm saying here. It is based on your niyyah. Everybody has his niyyah. Now some people don't as realize the, the power of niyyah. The power of niyyah. Allah says on Ammar bin Yasir, when he was forced to say hubal, when he was being punished, and in his heart, he was content to be a Muslim. Allah forgave him that expression of kufu, right? Because his niyyah was fine. Now, instead of fighting on these issues, we should be fair and we should leave, leave people alone on social media as well as... Because here's the reality of the situation. Let's say in the country where I was born, this is not even a holiday. I was born in Saudi Arabia, I know that there is no such thing as Mawlid, right? So when you're in Saudi Arabia, respect that. Let's say if you go to Maghrib or you go to Pakistan, over there it's an official holiday, right? You get a day off. Why would you want to say, I don't want a day off? You have to respect the law of the land. Now some people are doing this and doing other things with it, that's their business between them and Allah. But you have to follow the country's rules, right? That's the way it is. That's the simple and common sense approach. And this is the reality of the hukum. The disagreement will continue. Some people will participate, some people will not participate. Some people will say it's wrong, some people will say it's not wrong. And so one of our ulama, actually, from India, very well known, his name is 
Alama Ashraf Ali Tanawi, Rahmatullah Ali. He says, and this is actually in Arabic. He wrote, he wrote a paper in Arabic. He says that the decision of Mawlid, he says, is like Batikh. Just to try to explain to the simple people. That there are many benefits hidden in this. But if you allow it openly for the people, the people are going to kill themselves eating Batikh. So he says, in my household, I make sure that when that day comes, I realize what that day is. And anybody in any country, while they celebrate or they do not celebrate Mawlid, if you ask them about their national day, their independence day, you ask them, is that bid'ah? So the Mufti will say, ayyamun man ayyam Allah. He will say, this is one of the days that God gave us as a gift. So it's okay to you know, go do fireworks, do give halwa, wear nice clothes, but on the Prophet's birthday, everybody has a problem. This is the real ayyamun min ayyam Allah. When Musa alayhi salam saved the Israelites, what, that did, what did that become? That became the fast of Muharram that we do every year, right? It's an anniversarial fast. The Nabi sallallahu joined that. And then when Ramadan came, he said, whoever wants to fast Muharram, he's okay. If you don't want to fast it, that's fine too, right? This is the ayyamun min ayyam Allah. These are the days of, law, of our Lord, like, you know, the... Christians say, the days of our Lord. Remind them of the days of your Lord when He gave you glory, when He saved you from the punishment, and He gave you the gift. And what better gift is than the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Now, let me tell you a true story. And this is an eye-opener for anybody who celebrates or doesn't celebrate. And this is the actual reason why I'm giving this khutbah. Three weeks ago, my wife belongs and she had the good fortune to be raised in the Prophet ﷺ city in Medina, in our beloved kingdom of Saudi Arabia. So one of her neighbors was a girl that she befriended. And you know, life moves on. She comes here, she goes somewhere else to Pakistan, her father finishes and so forth. So all of a sudden, she received a call from the mother of that girl, who was her friend, and he used, she used to be in Medina al Manawara. So on FaceTime, she talks to her, how are you doing? Everything is fine, right? So she asked that old lady, where are you right now? So that lady says, you know, I have come to Saudi Arabia for performing Umrah and I will perform Umrah and then I'll go back to Pakistan, etc., etc." Subhanallah, a week after that phone call, we hear that the woman passed away. So I asked her, can you find out from your mother how she passed away? Right? Everybody knows that the last action is the action that determines what kind of life you lived, right? So this is how this woman passed away. She performed Umrah on Friday. She prayed Salatul Isha in the Haram. She came back to her hotel to sleep. When her son went to wake up for the Hajjud, she had died. So a day afterwards, by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? And of course the authorities who have this responsibility in the Haramain, may God bless them, her janazah was praised, prayed in Muharram. And she was buried in Jannatul Mu'alla. Yani, fahmin nukta? People want, if I ask anybody, if you pay me $10,000, I'll guarantee you your janazah is prayed in Salt Lake City or Mecca. Who would you choose? Mecca. If I say you would be buried in Redwood Cemetery or Jannatul Mu'alla with Khadija, Sayyidina, Sayyidina Khadija radiallahu anha, and the big sahabas, who, who would you choose? Of course. So what gave her that position? So I called my father and I said, what, what was so special about these people? Right? So may Allah, if we follow some of the things they're doing, maybe we have this kind of death, where our, our janazah is prayed by people from all over the world who are coming there for Umrah, from Malaysia, from Iraq, from Pakistan, from Maghrib. So he said that the people were very simple. And there are two unique things about this couple. And her husband also died in a very good state. There are two, two features that stick out. Right? One of them is every month, they had a majlis of Mawlid in their home. 
they were so happy with the Nabi Sallallahu arrival in the dunya, every month they celebrated the Mawlid in their household. And the only thing they did was salawat on the Nabi Sallallahu <coughs> eat food, remember his history, and that's it. And do zikr of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And the second thing is they did not do any ghibah. And no namima. Now when you have a person who dies in this state, and he meets all the conditions, even from the strictest scholars. Because the scholars say, you know, if you fix one day of the year, that is bid'ah. These people are doing mawlid every month, ya akhi, for the last 30 years. Do you understand what I'm saying? These are real life things. This is not, I'm, this, is, this happened to me. So I'm sharing it with you. This is a first-hand account of what I heard from a person who's buried right now in Jannatul Mu'alla. <coughs> now, can Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow a person who is a destroyer of his religion to be brought to the Kaaba and be treated in such a manner and be placed in a holy place? I don't think so. <laughs> I think a person like that was doing something right in their life. And that something right has been shared with you. So give people a break. Don't take what they call mujabahat ala mawadi' fariha. Muntahi al qawlu fiha. Mujabahat. It's like I'm gonna just, you know, just make a, a gang war on this issue. Well, first of all, this is not an issue of ibadah. And even some of the ulama who used to say this is wrong, now they're saying that even your own birthday and this and that, you know, I can justify it for you, etc., etc., well, all that. Lessons learned from today. There are types of bid'ah that the ulama have disagreed on, and one of the bid'ah the ulama have agreed on. Both of the opinions are that any change to the Prophet's religious activity, salah, siyam, zakah, right? By the way, did you know that this whole thing about price fixing, like if you have the amount of money equal to the 85 grams of gold that never existed in the time of the Sahaba? So even some of the ulama of the opinion, this is actually a good bid'ah. Because they say, unless if you own gold, you have no zakah. <laughs> so I can give you examples upon examples upon examples about these things. But I've just given you the tip of the iceberg to humble us. Humiliate us. Because what we're dealing with is a religion for all people, all races, all people, before us, after us. Uh, please, can you explain the Arabic again? Which one? The one I just used to say. Yani, some of the ulama say, if you don't have money, you don't have money. But the value of the money is not the same in the time of the Sahaba. So the bottom line is this. Be merciful with each other. And follow the advice of Umar bin Khattab, that if you see your brother doing something, find an excuse for him. Instead of blaming him right off the bat, that this guy must be evil, this guy must be a person who's a deviant, he's doing destruction of the Prophet's religion. Al-Mawdu' laysa kama yarahu al It's not as easy to cut as people think. And this story that I told you is a true story. How can a woman be given such a rank that immediately after the Umrah, immediately after the Umrah, even before her deeds go up, you know, technically every Monday and Friday, Monday and Thursday, the deeds go up. So this sister performed Umrah Friday, and Allah called her even before the time was up for her deeds. Al-Umrah bain al-Umrah kafara. It's a kafara, right? And this kind of death, may Allah give us that kind of death. Say, Ameen. 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 So the lesson to be learned is to be humble with the sciences of Islam. To learn as a student, not to have takabbur. What is takabbur? Takabbur, the disease that we suffer from today in the U.S. mostly, as well as in other countries, is as soon as we gain anything from this religion, we consider ourselves to be righteous. And we consider ourselves to be saved while the other person is in doom. In Sahih Muslim, a man who was a sinner all his life in Jerusalem, 
a man who was righteous was his friend. And he used to tell the sinner, God will never forgive you. So God told Isa alayhi salam to tell that person. This is a correct hadith in Muslim. That tell the sinner, I have forgiven him everything. And tell the chaste or the good person, I have nulled all the good deeds. Who are you to be my sheriff downstairs? Who are you? Man yata'allahu alayhi. Who are you to play God on his creation? You're not. Neither am I. So the ulama have two opinions about bid'ah. One is the opinion of Imam al-Shafi'i and al-Izzu Abdul Salam and Ibn Hajar and amongst the many great scholars like Imam al-Ghazali that there is bid'ah wajiba, just like you have the rulings of Islam. Wajib, mandub, sunnah, hasan, munkar, all of that. Same is with bid'ah. Depending on your niyyah. And if you are anti bid'ah, then go write the Quran like it was revealed on the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Don't read Nahu and Sarf and try to tell me how you can read the Quran and make Alif Lam and something like Dal and something like Ya and Noon. Pronounce it. Tell me what it is. And if you're reading Nahu and Sarf, then you have to admit that Ali radiallahu anhu, when he ordered Abu Al Aswad Al Duwayli, to write the signs for the Muslims, it was a bid'ah without any doubt. So let's be humble with each other. And even though Rabi' al-Awwal has passed, we should try it every Friday to increase our remembrance of Allah first, and of course the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Because the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam has said, increase your salutations on me on the day of Friday. There are many books written by the ulama for that purpose where you can read the salawat on the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and send those salutations. And maybe me, we might end up like that woman. May Allah help us and guide us and reform our situation from where it is.